Good morning. Again, and welcome. I say that good morning because I want to welcome those who might tune in to us during the week. I don't know if you guys out in the audience knows, but we do have an audience who turn, tunes in our website or Facebook page and picks up our, our message, which is recorded. So we're so glad you joined us here at McCutcheonville. We're a friendly church on the corner, and we love to serve you. And that's what we're about this morning is serving. Uh, I, I've been preaching out of the great, great book of Joshua. And it has blessed my soul. I hope it's guided you in some ways. I, I began with this one verse again, as I began last week, because it it's kind of begins the summation or the, the capsule of the book of Joshua and what Joshua wanted all of God's people to learn after many years of warring and many, many years of, of coming back home and being restored to what was rightfully God's people and where he wanted them to be and how he wanted them to live. And so this morning, it, it begins with this verse that says, after all this, they, they got back home and the last part of, of verse, chapter 11, verse 23, it says, then they rested from war. And I, I guess I want to just reflect on that one more time this morning because maybe last week I stressed a little bit more that, yeah, our, our land is so caught up in being mad at each other and being at, against each other in nation after nation. And, of course, we have that, that ongoing concern in Korea with our son and daughter-in-law and grandson living in, in South Korea, but the whole land itself there and then what that might mean for the region and the world. But it, it goes so much more than that. You know, we, we need to rest from war and political strife, you know, Washington, D.C., we need to rest from war in our cities where we have police against people the, of the streets and we've now the, the verdict in St. Louis, it's, it's raised all that up once again and there's so much unrest there. We need to rest from the warring against each other when now getting really on a personal level within relationships with husband and wives, with, it, with children, with with. Uh, work co-workers or with bosses against the workers and all those things we just we need to rest from all that once and for all and our I believe our world would begin some healing heal our land oh Lord we pray that prayer from scripture you know but we need to we need to repent we need to come before God we need to ask and it shall be given to us so let's pray this morning that we might have some rest from this. God, we, we open this time of worship, of scripture and, and message, Lord, with asking that we might get rest from the disputes, the, the, the strife, the turmoil, the, the unrest throughout all parts of your creation, which was meant to be at oneness with you and with one another. Lord, teach us a new way. I ask that from you. People mess it up. We need it from you. You're the righteous one. That we might be righteous in your sight as we love and care for one another. Guide us through these precious words from Joshua this morning, I pray. Amen. So we move on. Joshua, at this point in time, is giving the message. In chapter 23, it's to the leaders. He broke the, the land of, of um, Israel was divided with the, the 12 tribes, and they each were represented with a certain amount of leaders. And, and first, Joshua wanted them to have the authority from God to be good leaders. And so he tells them this verse, I, or the, I you know, he didn't tell them this verse. He told them these words. He, he said this. He said, now, be very careful. Be very careful to love your God. It's kind of like you might tell your children or your grandchildren as they're, as they're going out the door. You've handed your, we have a 15-year-old back here, but if you've handed your 16-year-old the car keys, what are you going to tell them? Be careful, aren't you? When your little one maybe goes out to, to play with uh, neighbors or friends, be careful, right? Whenever uh, they get right across the street, look both ways, right? What's that? Being careful. We're, we're careful with so many things in life. When you're handling knives. When I was a little boy, you know, I, I loved to have a good pocket knife. I kind of got that from my dad, I guess. But, you know, you, you whittled 
or you cut, cut away from yourself. Well, I didn't always do that. I still have a lesson on that. I learned occasionally when I was cutting up uh, cantaloupe the other day. I cut this way and, you know, it hurts. Be careful. You learn a different way. You know, put that in your mind and remember it. And that's what Joshua was saying here. Be careful and think. Put what God has done for you, all his promises, all the ways that he has given you this land back. I mean, let's go back to Egypt, he says, and, and count the number of ways that God has shown you how much he cares about you. First, he parted that sea, didn't he? Then he fed you. Then he fed you and he fed you. And then you quarreled and you doubted and you rested for 40 years until all that had cycled through. Then he said, let's go. Well, you had to cross another body of water. Well, let's part the Jordan River. Let's get across the other side. And then there's this Jericho thing. I mean, God, time after time after time, if you acknowledged him, if you were careful, you know, even remember how they also had the Ark of the Covenant? It had to be done just right. It had to be out in front of them. They were careful to do that. Put it out in front of them. As if God was the one leading them through all that. Be careful. And when they did it that way, it worked out accordingly. Now, he said, don't forget that. Be careful. And that's a good message for the church. Be careful. Be careful in the way you talk about God. In the way you study about God. Ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to you through his words. Be careful to learn from God's Word. And then what? What are we supposed to do when we read God's Word? Put it in here. Make it matter. Make it matter. And then you might remember it once in a while. Be careful. That's some of that be careful. It seems like such simple words. In fact, this verse, when it jumped out to me when I was looking at it, I had just passed right over it. And then all of a sudden it popped out again. I guess it was for me then, right? <laughs> you need to be more careful. You need, if I was more careful, maybe years and years ago, I would have not decided to go one route with my career rather than ministry first. I was more careful to think about, or more careless, I guess, put it that way, to think about my way rather than God's way. I think if I'd have been more careful, he's, it, I mean, the call was, I don't think the call just suddenly appeared when I was 44 years old. That call was already there. The call had been there for a while. I wasn't careful to acknowledge that. And that's what we do so often. But God never pulls it back. God never holds back from us. His grace is always poured out and poured into us. Be careful. I'm never going to get through this, Joshua. I guess I love it so much. Uh, and now he's about to pass. He, they're about to sing it as well with my soul, Corey, at his funeral at 110 years old. And... Uh, about the way to go, about to go the way of the earth. And he just reminded them that he's never failed you. He has never failed you, this verse 14. God gave nothing he ever promised you has ever failed you. I bet one or two of you have made a promise or have said something, a vow, or said something along your journey that you haven't always backed it up, right? I have. God is not like that. That's that's one of the the Differences that is from human to God that because God will never fail his promises and we will. That's why the promise of Jesus Christ's death and life and the promise that he offers to us through that will never ever fail us. The promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ is, a, is the promise you will never, never, never be able to doubt. So we move on to some of the other things he wants to impart to us. In 16 he says, now, here's the deal folks. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, here's the downside. If you turn your back on it, which he told you to do, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you. And you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. This, tell, this one God. There's one true God. And if you look at any of the other gods, and we can name them if you want, you know, in our time, Buddha, um, Hinduism, Muslim, all those are, are false. He said, if there's one true God, that it, this is the one true God, serve him and serve him alone. See, they had in their land, there were all these regions and they might worship this one or that. There were, uh, the, the Canaanites were 
the God of choice for them. And some of the people who were already inhabiting all these regions throughout Israel were already seeing, hey, I kind of like this one. I might go there. He's, Joshua is telling their leaders, we're still in, in chapter 23, keep your people on track. Keep your people on track. Kind of the role of the pastor today, I guess. We're supposed to herd the sheep a little bit. Keep you within God's pen. Right? If you wander off, it's to tell other people. Not to go thinking the grass is greener on the other side. And it's not truly wandering anyway. It's just going to evangelize or tell, to tell others. Because here's a great warning in this. He will quickly perish. Did it happen in this nation? You betcha. It happened. Not long after this, the judges began to fail. Look at the history of Israel. That's, that's where some, the, from the law of, uh, you know, the first five books, we now are in Joshua and beginning the history, get into Kings and Chronicles and Judges and 1st, 2nd Samuel, you're looking at a lot of history, history of, of the nation of Israel and it begins to break down very quickly especially in the king. See, God had warned them, you don't need a king, you don't need these judges, just look to me, I will provide, I will give. And suddenly when they started going to human wisdom, worked decently for David, but after that, Josiah, Hezekiah, that's about it. Solomon for some part of his reign. And it began to fall apart to the point where all this that had been captured, all this that had been worn, all, won, all this had been restored, was captured. The northern kingdom by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom by the Babylonians, they went into captivity. And the nation has never been the same since. So, it will quickly perish. Amen. It happened. This warning actually took place. Okay. Jesus said, Jesus comes now. And yours is the good news. Always the good news. The good news is, is Christ who came for us, okay? And I, I love how Jesus met with his bumbling disciples. Because I think I'm a bumbling disciple. And he had such patience with them and such love for them. Because when he was with them on one particular occasion, he was with them in the northern part of Israel. They were up in Caesarea Philippi, a very northern region, a peaceful place. And he was gathered around telling them, and he, he, he asked them a very cool question. Because it's a good, cool question for us. He said, who, who do people say that I am? And you might get asked that question sometime. Who is this Jesus that you're so in love with, or you go to church on Sunday to, to worship about? Who do people say that I am? Well, I, why I say they're bumbling disciples, they kind of, you know, some of them are like we are in, in school. If we don't know the answer, we look the other way or we look down at our shoes or, or whatever. You ever been there? Don't know the right answer? You know, they, uh, prophet, you know, teacher, John the Baptist, you know, all those answers given. And finally, old Peter, Simon Peter stands up. And it's, you know, it's like he's the little boy. So, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and... And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What a statement. How did he know that? Jesus answered, how he said, you only know that because your father in heaven told you. He was starting to get it. He was starting to get it. And that's what Joshua wants these guys, to, these leaders to start to get it. To trust in God. To, to know that there's one that it will, will be there for you. So I go on with that story because it gets really cool from there. Jesus says, because you have done this, because you know this, Peter, you're, I'm going to build my church on you. The rock, you know, I got this stone down. The rock will be my church will build on you. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Like you're giving those keys to that 16-year-old to go out there, you know, in that car. It almost feels like that sometimes. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Peter, go for it. And you know what? He did that for you too. He did that for you too. I'll give you these keys to the kingdom of heaven. God has that much trust in us. It's humbling, isn't it? Well, did Peter get it very long? No. 
Because Jesus then went on to start to tell them what was going to take place to, for this to all happen. I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to be handed over to the authorities. I am even going to have to be crucified, which they couldn't get that one because that is the most distasteful, uh, absolutely abhorrent death that you can have. Crucifixion. I'm going to die. And Peter said, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And, and you know what? Jesus responds to that all of a sudden. Then he has to, he has to hold up three fingers to, to Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. I'm taking you out of here. Pray for me. You know, I, he, uh, Peter gave his humanness. He wasn't careful any lo longer to love the guard. He, he had Lord his God. Even though he'd been given the keys of heaven, he had been given all this. It was just back to that, and it's what we can so easily slip off into. And we have to make that choice to truly love the Lord God, to truly place him first in our life, to truly know him with all our heart, mind, and soul, to, to, to have this truly in our life. So we have to choose who we will serve. And I'm going to end it there this morning. It looks like we're going to get another week out of Joshua. I guess that's probably because I wanted to. I, don't, I hadn't thought that until we got up here. I have to choose who we'll serve. But the warning is Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My emphasis this week for my own journey and my emphasis I would like for you to have in, in, in your life this week and we'll come back and talk about it is that is a personal decision. That is a personal. When, when Joshua said, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, that throws it back to the people. It throws us back to you and I and says, so what do you choose? Choose God? Or choose the... God's beyond the Euphrates, it's, it's quoted in Scripture, choose the other way. This week, let's choose God. Let's make it important that our decisions, our tongue, <laughs> maybe our money, our desires are godly. Let me pray for you to take that home with you this week. Lord, we stop now. We're going to choose you right now. We're going to choose you. We're going to choose you. You're the one true God, the God of mercy, God of forgiveness, God of hope. Lord, uh, be at the front of all of our lives this week. Just be out in front of us. And when we look up, we know that you're there. You're there that we can inquire upon, that we can trust, that we can... Uh, seek help from. You'll be there for Victor on Thursday, for Lanny today, for, for uh, Nancy and her time of need. Um, Lord, for the, the, the baby in here, for, for everything, Lord. That you, We're going to choose to trust you with how we care and seek out one another. So guide us this week, I pray, through Christ. Amen.